and let the frustration begin. Why do I do this to myself, guys? I don't know. But thank you for you 500 viewers or whoever that's joining me for these videos. This is this week's project. This is a Dell 5558 motherboard. It's down as untested, but they tell me that it is not powering on. I don't have the DC in connector for this, so I'm going to have to jump around a couple of wires onto the board and provide power for my DC power supply. So let me do that now and see what happens when we try and power this on. So as you can see, I have soldered two jumper wires onto the board here to bring power from my DC power supply to the motherboard so that we can power it on. I'll show you how I set that up in a minute on the screen. But when I press the power button to power this on, it is pulling 0 0.416, well, just about 400 milliamps. And as you can see, we are not getting anything on the screen. So it looks like we have a power on, but no display situation. And with my laptop motherboard powered on, I've plugged in this USB keyboard. And if I hit the numlock key, nothing happens. And if I hit the caps lock key, nothing happens. So let's scan in the motherboard, take it to the screen and see if we can troubleshoot this. So this is our scan of the motherboard. Now, as I explained earlier, I don't have the DC in connection here for this. So I had to provide power to the motherboard with my own DC power supply. So let me show you how I set that up. So this is our DC in connector right here. And we have six pins in this one, two, three, four, five, and six. So let's mark those in. Now, from the schematic, I can see that the function of each of these pins is as follows. So we have two ground pins on one and two. Pin three is not connected. Pin four is our PSID. And pins five and six are where our positive DC voltage comes in. So to bring power to my motherboard, I introduce my DC power supply. I connect my black wire to ground. Ground here, I'm just using the metal part of my DCN connector. I connect my red wire to where we identified our positive DC voltage coming in on pins 5 and 6. I just solder a little wire onto the pin there. And I set my voltage to 19.5 volts. And as we saw earlier in this video, when I powered this laptop motherboard on, it immediately started drawing 400 milliamps. Now we know that the laptop motherboard is responding to the power button. So that's an indication that the input section has to be okay. But I'm just gonna show you quickly here the path that our voltage takes through the input section. Our 19.5 volts comes in at pin six where we're injecting and follows along this track and onto PU4201, which is our first MOSFET. That's a P-channel MOSFET. And if the gate pin of that MOSFET is low, that switches this MOSFET on and permits our 19.5 volts through to our drain pins. From there, it comes around and onto a second MOSFET, PU4402, which is this MOSFET right here. This is also a P-channel MOSFET. So if the gate pin is low, that switches this MOSFET on and allows our 19.5 volts through to our current sense resistor, PR4402. And from our current sense resistor, our voltage goes out to our battery management IC. To confirm that the input section is fully working, we introduce our multimeter in volts DC in a 20 volt range, plus our black probe to ground and our red probe to the current sense resistor, and we measure 19.50 volts. So the input section is good. If we look at the schematic, we can see this is our current sensor resistor right here, PR4402, and we have established that we have 19.5 volts here. This is our battery management IC. However, this is not a narrow voltage DC battery management IC. This is a little older. So in this scenario, we have our 19.5 volts coming through our current sensor resistor, and then it's sent directly down to all of our secondary circuits. So we've confirmed that we have 19.5 volts here, and that is our main power rail that's going down to all of our secondary circuits. It's labeled as DC bat out. What I need to do next is to confirm that our 3.3 volts always on power, and our five volts always on power are online. Now we know that it's responding to the power button, so it's very likely that our 3.3 volts uh, is working, but we're just gonna confirm it anyway. I'm gonna try and find the IC that's responsible for generating our 3.3 volts always on and our five volts always on. 
Further down the schematic, I have found PU4503, which is a TPS51225. Now, this I see, as we've seen on other older laptops, is responsible for generating two 3.3 volts outputs and two 5 volts outputs. So, I'm going to find this on the actual motherboard and take some measurements to see that this I see is getting its correct input voltage, which, as you can see here, is DC bat out. So, that should be 19.5 volts, our main power rail, and it should be generating our 3.3 volts and our 5 volts. So let's locate the IC on the board and take some measurements. Back to our motherboard and I have located PU4503. So this is our TPS51225. So let me mark in the pinouts just so we can see everything a little bit more clearly. And with my multimeter in volts DC in the 20 volt range I took the following measurements. First of all, starting with our input voltage, V in on pin 12, I measured 19.50 volts. So this is our main input power rail, and it's getting to our input for our TPS51225. On V reg 5, pin number 13, I measured 5.15 volts. On pin number 18, SW1, I measured 5.16 volts. On V reg 3, pin number 3, I measured 3.29 volts. And on pin 8, SW2, I measured 3.31 volts. So all of our voltages are working on this IC. So at this point, we've confirmed that our main 19.5 volt power rail is online. That's going down to all of our secondary circuits. And we've confirmed that our 3.3 volts and 5 volts are online. So I just wanted to do a sweep around of all of the other secondary inductors and confirm that they're online also. So we're starting at PL4801. That's measuring 1.10 volts. And if I look up my schematic, I can see PL4801 is on the 1D05 volt power rail. So that's correct. PL4701, I've measured 1.86 volts. If I look at the schematic, it says PL4701 is on the VCC underscore core power rail, but it doesn't actually give me a, a voltage measurement of what that should be. I presume it's correct. PL4501, I measured 5.16 volts. And as you can see here from our schematic, PL4501 is on the 5 volt power rail. At PL4502, I measured 3.31 volts. And as we can see in our schematic, PL4502 is on our 3.3 volts power rail. So this is correct. At PL4902, I measured 1.37 volts. And as we can see from our schematic, PL4902 is on our 1.35 volt power rail for our memory. So this is correct. Next, I wanted to check and ensure that our BIOS IC was getting the correct input voltage. And as you can see here, this is our BIOS IC, SPI25. If we look up SPI25 on a schematic, it says BIOS. And if we look at the pins on it, we can see VCC pin 8 is meant to have an input voltage of 3.3 volts. And when I measured at pin 8, I measured 3.29 volts. So our BIOS IC is getting the correct input voltage. All of our voltages appear to be online, so it looks like we have another power on, no display symptom. Now, in this scenario, there's a number of steps that we take, so I carried out those steps one by one. I disconnected the BIOS battery and pressed down the power button for 20 seconds, but that made no difference. I tried different memory in the motherboard, that also made no difference. I also checked the pins in the dim socket to make sure none of them are loose. Then I got my thermal camera, but nothing was showing up as heating up except for the CPU. I plugged in a USB keyboard, and as you saw at the start of the video, it was not responding to either the numlock key or the caps lock key. So I decided the next step to take was to reprogram the BIOS. I've connected to my BIOS IC with my CH341A, and I've connected that to the PC. I'm running AS Programmer here to program it, and the first step we need to do is to click the question mark and see if it automatically identifies it, which it does. It's this bottom one here. So we select the IC, I click Open to find a good BIOS file, which is this one right here that I found on bad caps. And we now click to Unprotect, Erase, Program, and Verify.
and as you can see at the bottom here it says programming memory with verification it's done and the execution time was three minutes so now that we have it reprogrammed let's try again so after successfully reprogramming the BIOS, I've connected my motherboard back up to power again. I've powered it on and as you can see, it's now drawing 230 milliamps, but I'm still not getting anything on the screen. However, if I go to the keyboard, you'll see that the keyboard is now responding. Both the caps lock and the num lock. And what you'll also notice is if I watch the current draw and hit control alt and delete, it does seem to be responding to the control alt delete. So I think that this laptop motherboard may indeed be working now after reprogramming the BIOS, given that the keyboard is now working properly and it's responding to control alt delete. However, I think it's not going to boot without having the original screen connected. That's what I think anyway. Please post down in the comments below if you think different. The one difficulty about buying these individual motherboards is that they come with no heatsink, no power button, no hard drive, no memory, and most importantly, no screen. And no keyboard, of course, and touchpad as well. That makes troubleshooting it difficult. Now, if it was a shorted motherboard, it would be easy for me to find the problem, uh, find a shorted component, remove it and replace it. However, almost all of the laptops that I get seem to be power on and no display. I don't know why that is, but when I'm troubleshooting that type of fault, it's very difficult to do. Or I'm finding it very difficult to do without having the full laptop chassis. That is where I must leave it for this week. However, I have one question for you before I go. What percentage of devices that come to you for repair have a short circuit? I've looked at other YouTube channels and they say something between 70 to 80 percent of the devices that come into them are short circuit and a reasonably easy fix of the stuff that i've bought over the last four months zero percent have been short circuit so i just curious to see am i getting all of the hard cases or am i just not getting any better at fixing them please post down in the comments below what your percentage is and i'll catch up with you next week